Okay, welcome everyone. Um, the, the head of the department, Sergi Jorda, asked me if I could uh, introduce uh, today's speaker. Uh, we have the pleasure to have uh, Professor Gemma Piella, uh, who will explain about her, her trajectory uh, and her current research as well. Um, as you may know, uh, Gemma has been in the department since uh, 2005, I think it is, yeah? First, first as uh, Ramonica Hall Fellow and later as Associate Professor. Uh, she holds a telecommunications engineering uh, degree from UPC here in Barcelona and a PhD from the University of Amsterdam in Netherlands. She has been also a Marie Curie Fellow in, in Paris, in Telecom Paris. And currently she is co-directing uh, the Symbiosis Research Group. Um, I think she has uh, quite a lot to tell about also her past research, so I will just pass the word to Gemma, please. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. So, okay, although he has already presented me, uh, yes, I'm, an, I, I'm a telecommunication engineer and I did my, my thesis in on image fusion and compression in the University uh, of Amsterdam. Then following this topic, I did a postdoc, a Marie Curie postdoc in Telecom Paris Tech. And then I came here around 2006, first as a visiting professor, uh, then as a Ramonica Hall, and since uh, 2010 um, as an associate professor. And here my, my research has uh, focused mainly on biomedical image analysis and biomedical data integration. So, <clears throat> in 2013, uh, together with uh, Professor Miguel Ángel González Ballester, we es established the Symbiosis Research Group, which uh, mainly focused on medical image analysis, computer assist surgery, and uh, biomechanics. We work in close collaboration with both industrial and clinical uh, partners, uh, we are very much motivated by the clinical impact. So we want that our, what, the methods that we develop have um, a clinical translation into, into practice. And this is why our research is uh, integrative in the sense that it's both methodological and applied. It's also in this line of uh, integrative uh, research and multidisciplinary uh, team working, that uh, two years ago, uh, we decided to join forces with other uh, biomedical groups here in the department, and we formed the Barcelona Center for New Medical Technologies, which consists of five research groups. And uh, we cover a very wide field of, of areas, going from image and signal uh, processing and analysis, through physiological modeling and uh, uh, biomedical electronics. Today, however, I'm going to focus on a very specific work, mostly in medical image analysis, but which has to do also with machine learning and, and clinical translation. <coughs> and I'm going to start by presenting one of the clinical uh, challenges in uh, in clinical diagnosis, which is integrating a big amount of different heterogeneous uh, information sources. And because of, of this uh, difficulty, many times um, this ends up as an underutilizing under this, uh, this information, and this can affect uh, clinical decision. So uh, what can we do with this uh, big amount of data? Of course, we need to process it, but also most to make the most of it, we need to uh, integrate to be able to interpret and even make uh, models. So mainly what we want is to integrate heterogeneous complex high dimensional data into some simple and compact representation that allows a more efficient processing of uh, this data. And this is precisely, as we will see, what manifold learning does. At the same time, we are interested in answering the questions how and why illness occurs. And as we will see, this uh, machine learning can also help in this uh, interpretability. So um, what we try to do 
is mainly to emulate the, the way doctors work, which uh, mainly consists in linking different pieces of evidence and integrating uh, them with their own knowledge and comparing new, cas uh, new cases to um, previous uh, no. Uh, because manifold learning provides the structure, uh, well, on, discovers the, the structure of the data set, uh, can be used for this, um, for providing relevant comparisons between patients. And why do we want these uh, comparisons? Well, mainly uh, for relating to normality uh, or to subtype different types of uh, patients according to the, their similarities. No? So we want, for example, to be able to say that uh, these patients over here are uh, control, uh, while these ones are cognitive, uh, they have cognitive uh, decline, that they will not progress to Alzheimer's, while these uh, over here, uh, they will progress to Alzheimer's. And interestingly, uh, the same uh, methodology of manifold learning can also be applied to individual images. So now, while the image is a manifold, and uh, what we want is to relate different uh, images from the same patient, for example, at different modalities or at different time points. Uh, for example, here we have um, the same image from the from a patient, and uh, what we want to do is to fuse these two modalities because each one is <laughs> because each one is uh, complementary. Um, okay, so image registration is another possible application. So, in what remains of um, of this talk, I'm going first to introduce a little bit more formally what is manifold learning. Then I will uh, we will see how to um, can be applied to image registration and also for population analysis. So uh, let's start with manifold learning. A manifold is just uh, a space that locally looks Euclidean, but which globally can have a more complex structure. The typical example is planet Earth, which is three-dimensional, but um, for uh, local neighborhoods, we can approximate it by a 2D embedding, huh? uh, what we call uh, maps. Now, manifold learning um, ex assumes that this topology and the geometry of the underlying space is important for uh, managing and understanding uh, the data. Why? Because it can happen that the objects that we are working uh, with, they, are, they do not belong to Euclidean space, don't even belong to a, a vector space. For example, if we have two uh, images of a face like this and we perform the usual uh, mean, so a linear combination of, of these two images, we end, up, we end up with something that is not plausible. Uh, not plausible no? Um, and this is because we are not performing this combination within the manifold. Now, um, manifold learning has also to do with dimensionality reduction. It, in the, the observation is that uh, many times most of the data sets are only artificially high dimensionally. For example, here we have a data phase of faces of 64 by 64 which makes uh, then that they are objects in uh, 4,096 dimensional space. However, we can capture quite well the variability in this space by just three parameters, which would be the, um, the angle of the head, uh, top and, and down, uh, left and right, and the third one would, would be the intensity. So we can go from more than 4,000 dimensionality, we can reduce it to just three dimensions. So the definition would be that, okay, manifold learning assumes that the data lies 
on uh, a low dimensional manifold embedded in a high dimensional one. And what we want to do is to uncover this low dimensional embedding. Um, how? Well, um, while trying to preserve um, local relationships and local structure. And this can be done uh, in very different ways. One possibility would be, for example, to try to preserve local distances. Uh, but in, in any case, the concept of local relationships, local structure is important. Eh? Distance should be measured along the manifold. No? It's not the same, for example, here we have three, um, three points, A, B, and C, and the Euclidean distance could be uh, larger from A to B than from A to C. But in fact, if we follow the manifold, the distance between A and B is smaller than the distance between B and C. So how can we implement this manifold learning? Well, we can approximate uh, the manifold through uh, a graph. <coughs> and the graph is a discretized approximation of the manifold. And then uh, we can apply um, graph, uh, graph analysis to infer which is the topology and which is the geometry of uh, the data. It can be shown that um, by uh, constructing the spectral decomposition of the graph, this captures the topology and geometry of the manifold. A graph is just an ordered pair uh, where each of the samples would uh, correspond to one node in the graph, and these nodes are linked by edges which denote the similarity or the closeness between these two samples. So in, in, at the end, what we have is a uh, similar, similarity or affinity matrix in which each position, i, j, um, encodes which is the similarity between data sample i and data sample j. And uh, according to, to, to this, we can consider the, the, the eigenvectors of this, uh, of this affinity matrix as structural descriptors of the, of the manifold. Uh, so to sum up, um, the assumptions in manifold learning is that the data is on a low uh, dimensional uh, space, and that uh, we can approximate this, uh, this manifold by constructing a graph, a local neighborhood graph. And once we have this graph, um, we um, can apply spectral decomposition and keep only the most important uh, eigenvectors to capture the most important characteristics of the, of the manifold. At the end, what we want is to find an output embedding Y, which is a function of this affinity matrix and of this uh, output embedding. Yeah, so we, uh, we want for each input sample X, we want to be able to apply it an low dimensional embedded Y, okay? Um, and in this reduction, um, going from capital D to uh, small uh, D is the, the low dimensionality reduction. And um, as I said, uh, this is minimizing this is uh, equivalent to a generalized eigenvalue problem. Why? Because we can see this affinity matrix uh, by construction is positive semi-definite matrix and therefore can be decomposed as a um, linear uh, combination of uh, eigenvectors and eigenvalues. So uh, we can easily, um, the, we can say that the problem of uh, minimizing this uh, upper function is uh, tantamount or equivalent to a generalized eigenvalue problem. Uh, as an example, I'm going to uh, present one of perhaps the most typical manifold learning approaches, which is called Laplace and Eigen maps. The idea here is that closed samples in the input space should remain also close in the output space. Now, closed samples in the input space means that x i and x uh, j are um, 
are similar, and therefore these weights, W, I, J, are high. If these weights are high because of the minimization, uh, what the algorithm is going to do is to, po to push um, that uh, the output embedding, um, Y, I, is close to the output embedding of uh, sample uh, uh, J. Okay? And as I said, and for this particular case, this is, uh, well, this is equivalent to this um, eigenvalue problem, where here L is the, what is called, uh, is what is called the Laplacian um, graph, which is basically a function of these uh, affinities of, of these similarities of the sample. And here V denote uh, the, um, the eigenvectors and lambda the eigenvalues. So these weights can be obtained in several weights. One very uh, common form is through kernels, okay, and specifically, for example, these uh, Gaussian kernels. But there are many other ways in which uh, it is possible to, to obtain these, these, these weights. Okay, so at the end, what we will have is that we will map the high dimensional uh, sample XY into a low dimensional where the coordinates will be the corresponding coordinates of the eigenvectors. Okay, so the first coordinate we, uh, will be uh, corresponding to the first eigenvector, the second coordinate to the second, and so on. So let's see now how this can be applied to to image registration. Image uh, registration is uh, nothing, uh, nothing else than uh, putting into correspondence uh, two images. Okay, so what we want to do is uh, we have the, an image that we want to transform, that we call it moving image, and we want to find a spatial transformation such that applied to this moving image, makes the resulting, uh, the form image, more similar to the target image, which is called also the fixed image, okay? Now, um, okay, so let's just now use. This can be formulated also as an optimization problem, where mainly what we are trying to, to do is to find the spatial transformation phi such that the distance between the fixed image and the transform moving image is uh, minimal. Because this problem is ill-posed, we usually put in additional regularization to have more, contr uh, more uh, control over the, um, the transformation. For example, uh, usually we want it to be smooth or to have uh, differentiability properties. Now, how uh, well, the, key, the difficult, the tricky thing is uh, how to compute the image uh, distance between the, the images. Of course, this depends very much depending on the, what type of images we are comparing. Uh, for example, if they are images from the same modality, we can apply uh, simple measures such as Euclidean uh, distance or normalized correlation. However, in medical image, uh, many times we have uh, images which are from different modalities because each modality uh, complements uh, the other and allows to see uh, different things. And uh, when this happens, um, the um, the intensities are very, very different one from the other. For example, here in these brain images, the, the central part uh, in the T1 magnetic resonance image is um, it's, uh, quite uh, black, but while it's, um, in the T2 uh, images, is, uh, the intensities are quite bright. So in this case, we cannot use direct comparison of uh, intensities, and we have to look for m a little bit more complex measures, such as, for example, mutual information, which has not to do directly with the intensity, but with the statistics of the intensity. Alternatively, what we can do is to try to find 
and uh, what we call a structural image representation that would be a representation that uh, it's modality independent in the sense that it does not depend on the intensities used to encode the, the structures, but just on the structures themselves. So once we have these structural image representations, then uh, we can um, <coughs> apply simple measures like uh, Euclidean distance or normalized correlation to register the images. Now, in fact, these structural image representations can be obtained using manifold learning because as we said, uh, an image can be interpreted as a manifold and we know that the eigenvectors of, uh, of the similarity of the affinity matrix uh, characterize the structure of the manifold. So the idea is, okay, I have the, my input image, I uh, try to estimate the, the manifold that it represents to a, a graph, and then I, I compute the, the eigenvectors and, and eigenvalues of, of this, obtaining, uh, therefore, the structural image representation. Of course, this can be applied for image registration eh? because the assumption is, okay, if two images are aligned, then their structures are going to have similar uh, Laplacian eigenspaces. So uh, this would be one approach. Uh, to obtain independently the Laplacian of, of each of the moving and um, fixed images and try to register uh, them. There is, however, a, technical uh, uh, complication that is that because we are computing the, La, the Laplacian independently for each of the images, we cannot ensure that they represent the same eigenspace. So they have the same structure, is yes, but because they can occur swapping because uh, between the eigenvectors and, and chains of signs, we can end up with an embedding which is uh, rotated, translated, and scaled uh, with respect to, to other modality. So previous to registration, we have to, um, re uh, we have to rotate, translate, and you know, scale, if necessary, the, the, the embedding. Okay. Um, or what is the equivalent to perform a chain of buses of the eigenbuses. Now, uh, okay, so as an alternative, instead of computing the, the, Laplacian, eigen, the Laplacian graph of every image uh, independently, what we could do is to try to find a transformation such that the graph Laplacian of both the fixed image and the transform moving image um, are uh, jointly diagonalizable. And therefore, they share the same agent vectors. Uh, what does it mean that they are jointly diagonalizable? Well, um, two matrices are jointly diagonalizable. If we can find a unitary matrix, which in fact is nothing else that they join eigenvectors vectors of both Laplacians, such that uh, these products um, are diagonal, okay? Now, um, this is uh, just an example. Here on the left column, we have the, the, the images that we want to register. Uh, at the top, we have the fixed image. Um, then it follow the moving image when it is uh, not registered. And uh, below, there is the moving image after registration. Uh, the next two uh, columns represent the individual, uh, some of the individual eigenvectors of the corresponding graph Laplacians. Um, the first column corresponds to the first eigenvector, and the second column corresponds to the sixth eigenvector. Okay, and then in the third uh, block, we depict the joint eigenvectors of the fixed and moving image before alignment and the fixed uh, moving image after the alignment. And what uh, we can see is that um, the, the, the lower one, the after alignment, are much similar to the 
individual uh, eigen, eigen spaces, which means that uh, they are going to diagonalize uh, much more than not uh, in, in the case that the images are not um, aligned. Now, the problem with this, of, of computing's jointly diagonalization, is that it's uh, very expensive. Computationally, it's very expensive. And moreover, the registration is an iterative process. So computing this uh, joint diagonalization at each iteration is impractical. So uh, the thing is, uh, can we do similar things but without the need of computing these eigenvectors and these eigenvalues? So without the need of computing this uh, output embedding? And uh, yes, uh, we can do it. Uh, using uh, linear algebra, which mainly says that two symmetric matrix are jointly diagonalizable if and only if they commute. That they commute, they mean that the product uh, satisfies the commutative uh, property, so that uh, matrix L1 by L2 is the same as L2 by L1, or equivalently that this uh, subtraction uh, it's uh, equivalent to a, a, a zero uh, matrix, okay? Because the Laplacian graph are symmetric matrices, we can conclude then that commuting Laplacians are jointly diagonalizable. So now we don't need to compute this joint diagonalization through the computation of the eigenvectors and eigenvalues, but we can play with this of finding a, uh, a spatial transformation phi such that applied to the moving image, um, it is most similar to the fixed image. So we have two terms here in this distance. The first corresponds to the quantification of the, um, how much the matrix is commuting. So the, the more they commute, uh, the more and more uh, this uh, will be. And then the second term acts more as a regularizer uh, when we, what we are uh, enforcing is that the structure of the transformed moving image is similar to the structure of the fixed mean uh, moving image. So uh, we apply this distance, which uh, we call closest commuting operator distance, and compare it to other uh, registration uh, measures, in particular to local and and normalize mutual information. So in these tables uh, below, we see each row corresponds to a different data set. Now we will see some examples. And um, we compute the error, the registration error, between the computed, uh, the, the estimated transformation uh, and the ground truth, because we have the, the ground truth. So, and we do this for uh, synthetic data, just like uh, these simple images with variations in the gradient, or uh, other images like uh, different modalities, visual and infrared. We also apply it to medical images, like uh, registering two uh, magnetic resonance, but uh, different magnetic resonance, T1 and T2, or to uh, register, for example, uh, magnetic resonance images with uh, ultrasound images. And in our cases, what we found is that the distance based on the closest commuting operator um, gives significant uh, lower registration errors. Okay? Okay, so this uh, is everything about the, um, the application to image registration. And now I'm going to focus on on the application on population analysis. Now here, every, uh, every image or every set of, of measures of one patient are a point in this high dimensional space, okay? And for this application, it's uh, useful to think about, kern about uh, manifold learning methods at, as kernels methods. Kernel's methods, what they do implicitly is to map the input space of the X, they map it through this uh, phi to a higher dimensional space. And in uh, manifold learning, what we want is that this higher dimensional space 
the manifold is uh, flat because then we can reduce the dimensionality by just linearly projecting, okay? Um, the nice thing about this is that we don't need to complete this file, this, uh, this um, uh, mapping to the high dimensional space, which is usually complex, but we just need to know the uh, inner products of this, um, of, of the elements in this uh, feature uh, vector uh, space. And this can be done through what the kernel matrix does. And they, every entry, entry of a kernel matrix, uh, it captures the similarity between the um, high dimensional uh, feature uh, space between one, one sample and the other. Now, the, um, the challenge is to know which kernel uh, should I use. Uh, there is, and this is uh, some open questions, okay? Uh, depending on the application, we might want to use one type of kernel or another. But uh, recently, what uh, many uh, researchers do is combining different kernels. This combination could be nonlinear, but could, could be as simple as linearly combine, combining different kernels. So to combine different concepts of similarity, okay? Um, okay. So that's what uh, we, we do. For every feature of every sample, so we have N patients and M features, and for every features, we compute a kernel, which is a specific to that feature or that uh, descriptor, and then we integrate this uh, similarity or affinities matrix into a one combined uh, kernel matrix. Once we have this, we can use it for uh, manifold learning, for classification, etc. In fact, this is what is known as uh, multiple kernel learning, and originally it was formulated for super vector machines. And what they did is they compute these weights beta together with the classification, okay? We are interested in supervised uh, learning. So instead of, of, of learning a, a classifier, what we learn is um, this beta, this weights beta, together with the uh, manifold representation, with the output in beta. So the, uh, what we want to learn is the projection matrix from this high dimensional space to the low dimensional space. So as I said, it's based on the Laplace and Eigen maps. This would be, as uh, we have seen before, the, the equation to, minima, to minimize in the Laplace and Eigen maps. And this can be, can be shown to, that it's possible to extend it to multiple features using kernels, okay? Now, each of these is the, the, the output coordinate, okay? Uh, which can be calculated from the projection matrix and from the combination of kernels. So we have an, uh, an algorithm uh, which jointly uh, performs this minimization. And well, yeah, the constraints, uh, the constraint uh, below is just to avoid trivial solutions, to avoid that all the points map to a single, to a single point. Okay, and uh, so finally, uh, I'm going to, to present uh, one example of how we can apply this, uh, in particular, we supervise multiple kernel learning to, um, to clinical practice. And uh, what we did is we analyzed uh, heart failure uh, patients and tried to predict if a given uh, therapy was uh, beneficial or, or not, okay, for these, for these patients. Uh, okay, so mainly, the heart is a, is a pump, okay? Uh, it's a pump which beats synchronously and um, it is because uh, 
the, the electrical signals which are origi originated in a very specific place of the, of the heart, um, that uh, they propagate to the different conduction ways and make that this pump uh, simultaneously uh, uh, move um, is able to, to pump the, the, the blood uh, through the arteries, uh, through the organs and tissues. Now, when there is an alteration in this uh, electrical uh, conductivity, uh, can result in that um, our, our ventricles, or our chambers, uh, beat in not a synchronous way. And this is quite inefficient. So this can end up with uh, having a, a heart failure, a heart failure. <coughs> so one, one possible therapy for this a specific type of, of heart failure uh, patients with uh, arrhythmia is to implant uh, a device which is called cardiac resynchronization therapy. And this device sends a, a small electrical impulse which helps to improve the synchronization of the, of the pumping of the chambers, okay? Uh, however, this uh, therapy um, has a very big proportion of, of patients which do not respond to this therapy, around 30%. And also, it uh, involves some risk, and it's expensive and, and time consuming. So it would be very interesting if we could, s in some way, identify between the, uh, these uh, candidates to the cardiac resynchronization therapy, uh, which ones will respond to the therapy and which uh, will not. So for this, we analyze a, a cohort of more than uh, 1,000 uh, heart failure patients, which uh, some of them uh, were applied uh, cardiac re re resynchronization therapy, and some of them just a placebo because they just have the, an, a defibrillator, okay? And we look at different echocardiographic descriptors, for example, the, the volume of the, of, of the, um, uh, of the ejected blood uh, during the cardiac cycle, but also the deformation of the different uh, regions of the ventricle and together with other clinical parameters, so for example, the age, the, the sex, the fact of having had a previous hospitalization or being ischemic, uh, et cetera. So we combine all these different types of data and try to uh, obtain this simplified representation, but at the end we end up with uh, an out, uh, a cloud of points such as of this, and within this uh, cloud of points, we try to see if we could find clusters, cluster of patients which were similar. And what we uh, mostly, and uh, the most significant um, clustering was achieved for five clusters, five clusters of, of phenogroups. Um, and these five clusters of phenogroups had uh, distinct, uh, both clinical and echo uh, characteristics. And also we compare which was the, um, the comparison of the survival to see if the therapy uh, worked well or not. No? And what we saw is that in some of these groups, uh, the therapy works uh, pretty well, and others, it seems that it doesn't work or even uh, does not improve. Uh, in particular, we find a group, which was uh, in this case uh, group two, which uh, corresponds to super responders. This means that for these patients, um, uh, here in this graph, you can see the, the fraction of patients who had a bad outcome. So the lower blue, uh, the, um, the blue line corresponds to those that did not uh, have the cardiac resynchronization therapy, while the reddish uh, line corresponds to the 
to those that uh, they had cardiac resynchronization therapy. And what we can see is that after three and a half years, uh, those that had the therapy um, had uh, much better prognostic than the others. In contrast, we find another cluster, which was a little bit the opposite, was uh, they were no respondents in the sense that um, there was no difference, uh, at least not significant uh, difference, between uh, those that had uh, therapy and those that uh, had not. Now, also what is interesting, this is related to what uh, before I was telling about interpretability, is to be able to, to see how we can go from this output space to the input space. So we can see which is the variability uh, for each of the features and each of the dimensions. For example, uh, for dimension number one, if we look at cluster number two, which were the super respondents, and we look at the deformation patterns of the different regions of the ventricle, um, we obtain this, uh, the upper uh, graphs. Uh, and um, what we can see Plot is um, there is a, like a sudden up and down uh, movement, which uh, we hypothesize that uh, uh, it corresponds to a dyssynchrony movement called septal flash, and, is it, and it is known that uh, patients who have these dyssynchrony patterns uh, respond well to the therapy. In contrast. Uh, for non-responders, what we see is that uh, there are especially some of the regions <coughs> of the ventricle do not have uh, a normal deformation pattern. Uh, and this uh, cannot be solved by... Uh, this, they, they practically are ischemic and not, uh, not deforming, so therefore they it cannot be solved by... Um, this device, by the cardiac resynchronization therapy device. Okay, this is just uh, one example. We have some more, but with this, I I want to to finish the presentation. So my, mainly, what I have presenting is uh, what is uh, manifold learning is, which in fact is a kind of learning and representation. And in this sense, we can see it as a manifold learning approach. Uh, and the idea is that uh, we can embed the data into a low dimensional uh, space which captures the main local uh, structures. And uh, what we want to do is uh, to uncover which is the low dimensional uh, manifold. Okay? And this um, provides a, a geometric interpretation of, of that analysis. And uh, because it gives us the intrinsic structure of the data, this applied to single images can be used, for example, for image registration or image segmentation, and applied to a population of, uh, of patients uh, can be applied for analyzing, uh, to compare into normality or to compare into, or to subtype or phenotype uh, different groups of patients. Uh, manifold learning uh, through this combination of, of kernels is allows in an easy way to integrate multiple heterogeneous uh, features and also it uh, in some specific cases it allows us to go uh, go and back from the input space to the output space uh, so that we can uh, interpret uh, which each of these uh, dimensions in the output space represents mm -hmm. and how each input feature uh, contributes to the output. And okay, this is uh, everything. Uh, I want to give thank you uh, to Symbiosis Group and in general to Barcelona 
historical technologies and for the funding uh, projects. So if you want to to do some questions. <laughs> Any questions? Don't be shy. <laughs> yes. Yeah, thank you. Nice for, for the presentation. It was quite quite dense. So in the case of image registration. Um, intuitively, I mean, to me, uh, what uh, not being related to that, what would make sense is to identify, let's say, the pattern of the image, and then to try to move. Because uh, in a lot of cases, we are talking about rotations, uh, scaling. Uh, well, and in these are the easy ones. We mm. say it's just rotation, translation, and scaling. Mm. But uh, for example, if we want to to measure how a tumor evolves we might want to well to to non rigidly uh, register the the images or for example how the the cardiac uh, movement uh, how the um, the heart performs we are, uh, this is certainly a non rigid uh, registration so what we are looking is for a spatial transformation which yes can be just a rotation a scaling and translation in the easy things but uh, mm, in the most of the cases, uh, what we want to do is trying to, to deform uh, one anatomy or one structure to the other, to be able to put into correspondences mm -hmm. the different. No, I, I think I understand that. The, the thing is that uh, basically at the end, it's, it's a matter of moving, let's say, pixels from one image to the, to the other image. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I'm saying is that uh, here you showed a method, I mean, basically, and a structure, and, uh, but intuitively, I mean, to me, it would seem that one possible way to do that is to identify specific kind of features of the image and then to move those images to those features. I guess this is used also. Yes. Uh, uh, so what I have present here is uh, the image registration based on the intensities. Mm. And in fact, when computing the structural representation, that's what we do. We are computing some features, and then we are registering these, these features. And you label them? These features are labeled? Uh, no. No, that's fine. Uh, not, no, well, not necessarily. They can be labeled or, or, or not. In the particular case of images, it is a very complicated problem for uh, computer, yet it seems to be a very simple problem for humans, even for an uneducated human or even a child. In fact, in the internet, I understand this is used to, to tell the difference between a human and a robot, right? It's the CAPTCHAs. Does the scientific community have an explanation of why we humans find this so simple to do and a computer has such a hard time? Mainly what we do is uh, we compare what we see with our previous knowledge. And we know what a face is, and we know the, uh, it's easy for us to see the topological uh, relations. For a machine, uh, that's the trend to go, no? to trying to explore these uh, structural uh, representations, but it's not uh, so is not uh, so right. Any other questions? Yeah. 
Nothing? Okay. <laughs> okay, then I think we'll thank Gemma again. Yeah.